Half a day and welcome. I'm Kimberly Keeling from Humanities Guahan. Thank you for joining us for this morning's webinar, Navigating the Law, Voting and Political Status Rights in Guahan, with Attorney General Levin Camacho in conversation with Attorney Vanessa Williams. Their conversation will explore the history of the right to vote in Guahan, as well as contemporary court cases within the context of Guahan's political status. I also want to acknowledge and thank our Maga Haga, Governor Lou Leon Guerrero for being with us today. This is the fourth webinar in a five part webinar series for the project Unincorporated, Voting Voices and Visions para Guahan, which will also include a digital magazine to launch this April. Unincorporated explores Chamorro stories, experiences, and voices in relation to voting rights, democracy, decolonization, and self-determination. Humanities Guahan received a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in partnership with the Federation of State Humanities Councils to produce this project as part of a nationwide initiative why it matters, civic and electoral participation. We see ourselves as the convener, connector and catalyst for the project as we explore why civic engagement matters through an examination of the political history of Guahan and the histories, experiences and diverse perspectives of the island's indigenous people. Humanities Guahan is humbled and honored by the opportunity to bring this important project to our island community and to feature such outstanding guests as the Attorney General and Attorney Williams. Thank you both. Now I'm gonna give a little introduction, a brief introduction to both the Attorney General and to Attorney Williams. So Levin T. Camacho is Guam's fifth elected Attorney General. Before being elected, the Attorney General was a solo practitioner who handled civil and criminal matters. During his law, law career, he's argued over 15 appeals before the Supreme Court of Guam, assisted the governments of Guam and the CNMI in reviewing complex environmental impact studies and litigated land rights and environmental justice cases. He also served as local counsel in a lawsuit seeking to extend voting rights to US citizens living in the territories. Before practicing law, Attorney General Camacho was a Guam public school science and reading teacher, network administrator in Seattle's public school system, and a fried chicken cook at a franchise restaurant in Guam. He attended John F. Kennedy High School majored in English literature at the University of Washington and graduated from Boston University School of Law. Attorney General Camacho and his wife, Jen, have two sons, Tanum and Tua. Vanessa Lee Williams is a Chamorro litigator and advocate for civil rights in Guam. Her law firm has spent the last 10 years representing and empowering women in a range of personal and business matters. She is also a founder and past president of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce, and in 2019 was recognized as the Women in Business Champion of the Year by the Guam branch of the U.S. Small Business Administration. She has taught legal research, research reasoning and writing, and law and public policy seminar at the University of Guam. She has a five-year-old daughter and another daughter on the way. So we're really privileged to have both the Attorney General and Attorney Williams with us today. And just as a short, brief housekeeping note, the Humanities Guaha staff will be fielding questions from the audience through the Zoom Q&A feature, as well as from Facebook for the Q&A part of the webinar. We ask that the audience hold their questions until then, and we will try to get to each of your questions or comments. 
So I'm going to turn it over now to the Attorney General, Levin Camacho. Thank you. Uh, can, can you hear me, uh, Kimberly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thumbs up. All right. It's always, uh, I find myself in these Zoom meetings about two minutes in and I haven't realized that I'm on mute. I guess I just want to start with uh, a disclaimer that as Kimberly mentioned, I'm a literature major, not a history major. So I can answer questions about Percy Shelley or Lord Byron, but in terms of history and legal history, I, I'm, I can only speak about what I'm familiar with and I'm gonna try my best to, to do that in today's presentation. Just to give an overview of what I am going to address for turning, before turning it over to Attorney Williams, just a brief overview of the constitution and the right to vote and then talk a little bit about how that works in the context of the territories in Guam specifically. And then I would end my portion by talking about, you know, in the context of voting and self-determination, what is it that we really should be pushing for? What are we pushing for? What are our current efforts and what other efforts may be? So again, crash course in the constitution and the right to vote. Um, and I've focused primarily on the 15th, 19th, 24th, amendments, as well as the Voting Acts, Voting Rights Act of 1965. So 15th Amendment, which becomes important as we talk about more recent cases, basically says that you cannot pro prohibit or you cannot prevent someone from voting based on their race or natural uh, national origin. And this is coming after the Civil War, uh, the abolition of slavery. So 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments were all adopted around the same time and you had equal protection of law, abolition of slavery, and then the right to vote. And to limit or prohibit a state from restricting or making racial restrictions on the right to vote. After that, the 19th Amendment is enacted, which is gives women the right to vote. And we last year celebrated 100 years of the 19th Amendment, and there was a lot of good work on that. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that means for Guam and how that played out in Guam a little bit down the road. The 24th Amendment, is enacted in 1962, and it's not one of the more popular amendments. But as we talk about, and we look at recent efforts to address voting rights federally and voting efforts across the states, it becomes more important to see this deals with poll taxes and eliminating barriers essentially to people exercising the right to vote. And in particular, when you look at the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, and racially, what happens when you are trying to continue to disenfranchise certain segments of the population. Voting Rights Act of 1965 is also relevant to some of the more recent cases, but that was really meant to add more teeth to what the 15th Amendment had initially sought to do and the 24th Amendment. So the, the, for me, the big takeaway is we have the 15th Amendment. You are no longer allowed to discriminate against someone based on race and when it comes to voting, and yet we've had to continuously have federal amendments passed, federal statutes passed, local statutes, because there always will be efforts to maintain power and to disenfranchise those who may not share your political views. So how does this work with the territories? And for us in Guam and other territories, it starts with Article 4, which is a, uh, an article that many of us are familiar with, but it means all the world for us. And it basically says that Congress has plenary or absolute authority over the territories. And this is a quote from early 1900, 1898, Guam was acquired through the Treaty of Paris. And I, I just bring this up. And when I look at this quote and I think about a certain congressperson who made a comment about Guam being a foreign country, and rightfully there was a lot of people upset about that, but you know, the reality is from 1900 to 2021, there are still a lot of people who will never accept those of us who aren't part of the continental United States as, as being part of America or American and all. And it really reminded me that, you know, people are saying, oh, this is anti-American. You know, she should know that we're part of America. And this is a fabric. This is the way that the territories have been treated historically. And you see through the development, this is a, a representative of Congress and it makes its way through um, in the Supreme Court of the United States. So 1901, the United States is kind of continues expansion and Alaska, Hawaii are at that point territories. And there is a constitutional question of whether or not the constitution automatically extends to the territories or whether it is limited in nature. And these are the cases that are known as the insular cases. And there's a series of them. 
but Downs versus Bidwell is, is one of the seminal ones. And for our purposes, it really points out that race was one of the primary reasons that there was a decision to not have the constitution fully apply into the newly acquired territories. And the justification was because these new territories are so racially different from those of us who are part of America, we wanna think things a little bit, we wanna slow it down a little bit and to think about our, our next actions. And some of them thought it was would be benevolent, but you know, again, it really had to do with being the racial other as it continued to expand. An interesting uh, comment on this is some constitutional scholars have argued that the Insular case has actually created an, an exit strategy for the United States. That if they acquired territories and then down the road they decided it wasn't going to be beneficial for them, they had an, an ability to sever ties and to allow for the territory to become independent. And an example of that would be the Philippines where they were initially a US territory and then they were able to take a different path and, and become independent. So insular cases adopt what is known as the doctrine of territorial incorporation. And it identifies two types of territories, incorporated and unincorporated. If you are incorporated, there is some indicia that you are destined for statehood. And automatically the entire benefits of the constitution are granted to the residents of that territory. On the other side, they, there are unincorporated territories and in those situations, only quote unquote fundamental personal rights would automatically be extended to the residents of those territories. Now, some of the factors that the court looked at in deciding whether you were incorporated or unincorporated in the case of Alaska was that they, Congress had extended citizenship to the residents of Alaska when it adopted their Organic Act, which brings us to the issue that there is no constitutional right of, of citizenship. This is something that Congress extends. Those of us in Guam are citizens by virtue of federal law, not by the Organic Act. There has been some recent litigation uh, involving this issue with American Samoa. And there is this um, residents of American Samoa are, are US nationals. And there is a question of whether or not the 14th Amendment automatically makes them United States citizens. And it is, as much as it sounds like a pretty straightforward question for us, it is one fraught with political tension in American Samoa because they voted. There have, there have been votes where folks have not wanted to become US citizens because of the concern that if they become US citizens and the constitution fully applies, a lot of their programs will now be subject to constitutional challenge under equal protection and other types of laws, 15th Amendment, which we, we've seen happen here in Guam. So, U.S. citizenship wasn't extended and we talk about, okay, if we get citizenship, now we have the full benefits of the constitution and the answer to that is no. Just because you are U.S. citizens, you have one right. And in this case out of Puerto Rico, which dealt with the grand jury, they said, if you want to enjoy the full rights of citizenship, you can move to the United States. And at that point you will have all the protections that you would be entitled to. Uh, so it really was more of the right to travel and and then enjoy, enjoy the full benefits of the constitution. And again, Vanessa will talk a little bit about this when it comes to voting for president or having federal representation. So to, to give a timeline of how things have developed in Guam, starting with the 50th amendment, and then we have the Treaty of Paris, which is when Guam is acquired by the United States. The 19th amendment is adopted in 1920. We have our Organic Act, which is a significant change for Guam because at that point, we finally are given citizenship, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then the Elected Governors Act of 1968. Now, the reason why I think this timeline is, is very, and I find it fascinating, is we did not have an elected governor until 1971, I believe, was the first elected governor. So we have 100 years that go by where we have constitutional amendments, prohibiting the restriction of voting based on race. We have 1920, the 19th Amendment, which prohibits you from discriminating based on gender when it comes to voting. We are given citizenship, but yes, you can discriminate against who can vote and why you can just, or based on race and gender, but if you're completely denied the right to vote, 
um, then it becomes a question of, well, Congress has that ability. And another, I, I would say interesting, at least I find it interesting, is that we did not have an organic act. Most territories get an organic act pretty quickly. We were a territory for 52 years before we had ours and we were actually governed by an executive order that was issued and under the president's executive power. So although article four talks about Congress's authority to make rules and regulations over the territories, we were the longest example of a territory that was governed by a president essentially and appointed by a military leader from the president for decades. So as we think about the right to vote and we think about how it has played out in Guam, we were governed and did not have an elected governor until decades after we were initially acquired by the United States and became US citizens. Now, 19th Amendment is passed and you would say, okay, women would be able to vote. It's not quite that simple. So we have a case out of Puerto Rico where after the passage of the 19th Amendment, they said women should be able to vote. There was a local statute that limited voting to men and a constitutional challenge was brought saying, now we have this amendment, the right to vote is fundamental. We should be able to participate. And the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico said, no, a woman's right to vote is not fundamental. It's a personal right. Um, and as much as we might empathize with you, sorry, you will have to take it up with your local legislature to change that restriction. This shows the difference in the territories where no state could have discriminated against women from participating in elections. I happened to look up the case that was cited to in the Puerto Rico case. And for those of us, it's Women's History Month and Guam, we have a matr matrilineal society. So it was interesting to see the way that they talk about women and this experiment of what, what will happen? Oh my gosh, you know, oh dear, if, if women are allowed to vote, it could be terrible consequences. And this just shows that even something is at this moment, non-controversial, a woman's right to vote for decades was extremely controversial and there was a lot of opposition to it. And the 19th amendment, they had to fight very hard to get it passed and it barely, I think Tennessee was the, the last state to ratify it before it was, was eventually adopted and certified. So all the things that we kind of take for granted, okay, we can't discriminate based on gender. Well, it took a lot of effort to get us to that point. The right to vote for president is not fundamental. And again, Vanessa is involved in some litigation that will, will address us a little bit more. But if you did not know, the attorney general in 1984 filed, uh, sued the federal government, arguing that US citizens living in Guam have a right to participate and to vote for president. And the Ninth Circuit said that because the presidential elections, presidents are elected by electors uh, and we don't, are not a state, it is not a constitutional violation to not give us an opportunity to vote for president. So I, I, this is something that I don't think a lot of people are, I, I was not aware of it until um, I, I started getting involved with some of the things that Vanessa is currently involved in. I'm just gonna transition a little bit more and you're thinking to yourself like yogurt. And for those of you who have kids, uh, frozen yogurt, you bring them there. And my youngest son, he just picks the most random toppings. Um, and he also will pick random flavors and yours. No rational human being would do that. And I, I look at this in terms of what do we really want? And I know yogurt say, like, okay, what, what, what kind of flavor do you want? What kind of fixings do you want? In Guam, when it comes to the right to vote, we've almost reversed it where we focused on these fixings, right? We have the right to vote. Okay, everyone can now vote for governor. Uh, we don't discriminate based on race. We don't discriminate based on gender. But at its core, the right to vote really involves the consent of the governed. And when you look at the structure of Guam and our political status as an unincorporated territory, we are like black licorice yogurt with all these beautiful fixings. Like the core itself is terrible, the taste. Um, but we have all this nice stuff on top of it. So as we think about the right to vote, and, and I think it really forces us to reflect on what do we really want as an island? Do we just want to get the right to vote for president? Do we just want a congressional delegate? Or is it something much deeper and more profound than that? Because we are ultimately at this point governed by an organic act subject to congressional change at any moment 
our citizenship is different. Um, so when we talk about political status and self-determination and the right to vote, they, those are all connected because at the end of the day, the right to vote assumes that you are participating in a government that you have consented to. And, and that's what legitimizes the entire process. And I'm, I'm seeing I'm speaking really fast here, I guess. Um, I have to like figure out what I'm gonna do for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe Vanessa will help me out, but I will have, I guess one, I wanted to show my tie because I'm very proud of it, that it's woven and you can't really see the features of it in Zoom. Uh, so yes, it's a very nice tie. And it's, it's odd, but I wanna end by saying lawyers aren't gonna change the world and lawyers aren't gonna, well, they're not gonna save the world. I, I, I will say that. And we have a lot of lawyers, you know, I, I'm very happy that I'm a lawyer but I'm glad that the Humanities Council is putting this on. And when you look at how much culturally things have shifted, how we're seeing our educators teaching more about Guam history. Um, when I was in school back in my day, we had American civics and a, a semester of Guam history, and we weren't really taught to be critical of our relationship with the United States and our unique place in the United States history. So as I see younger people coming up, um, it's very exciting that this, these topics are of interest when you see the arts also moving because with the national scene being what it is, and I, I'm looking at Georgia, where I believe they've now made it illegal to hand out water to people who are in line to vote or food. I mean, power is not gonna seed itself easily. And just because laws have changed doesn't mean there's been a change in power. You need to shift the culture and the mindset to accept and to embrace changes as they occur, because no matter what the law say, if look, as a community, we are not prepared to accept it. Um, it's not gonna get us to where we need to be and, and where we want to be. So I've put in a quote from Julian, who I, again, who has a book coming out, but he's just kind of a good way of, of grounding us in, all of us have a role to play, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're an artist, whether you're just trying to raise a, your kid to be informed, to be a critical, consumer of information. Um, yeah, so I, I, I covered quite a bit there. Um, and I'd be more than happy, Vanessa, or if you have any questions or if there are any questions that have been submitted in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, sure, maybe we can, um, I can go ahead and just pick up the, uh, the context where you left off and we can do questions afterwards if we don't have any questions right now. I'm not seeing any on the chat. That work? Okay. Okay, um, let me see. I'm gonna go ahead and continue to share the screen. Hold on. I guess I am having some technical difficulty sharing the screen. Nicole, would you mind just pulling it up on the next slide and, and sharing on your end? Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to pick up the conversation um, and kind of uh, headed towards the direction of of discussing what the impact of the insular cases are on um, our voting rights and and self government self determination efforts and in order to frame the issue of what efforts should be made to move forward um kind of you know what toppings we're going to do what we're going to have even to use Levin's analogy with self-determination and voting rights, we need to go over our previous efforts to resolve political status. And, um, and then I wanna talk about what recent work has been done in the courts to address the insular cases um, and its impact on self-determination and voting rights. So I just have a very basic timeline um, that I'll try to move through 
quickly and interestingly. So 1973, um, so this is right after Guam has rejected unification with the NMI, the Northern Marianas Islands, in 1969. So um, the Guam legislature, in response, had established all these com official commissions to study options um, and issue reports and recommend plebiscites for uh, determining our political status. So 1973 was a uh, legislative status commission was created. And the purpose was to really ass assess Guam's um, economic, social, cultural, political situation, our environmental situation and see, and, and then see what is it that they, our island residents want? What are our needs and desires? And the legislative, the 1973 commission concluded that the most feasible option at that time, so it was for an improved interim political relationship was Commonwealth status, similar to Puerto Rico and which the Northern Marianas were um, undertaking at the time. Um, then in 1975, we see that a political status, another political status commission is created to organize a plebiscite um, and determine what it is that Guam wanted to do. But due to some political choices, it didn't include a Commonwealth choice. Um, and it actually, the purpose of the plebiscite was really with more an eye towards looking to whether Guam should uh, adopt a constitution and some type of improved federal relations act that would supersede or replace the Organic Act. And the 1976 plebiscite vote that um, resulted from that commission uh, showed that 58% uh, chose status quo with improvements, and then following that, 24% statehood. Um, so right on the heels of that vote, uh, Congress authorized Guam to go ahead and draft a local and federal relations act that was within this uh, the existing relationship that we had, our territorial relationship, but would replace the Organic Act. In 1979, Guam voters rejected the draft constitution that kind of um, came from that authorization. So uh, by the time we reach 1980, we're in a place where um, it's felt that the there is a lack of understanding by the public on the various political status options um, by the general population. And so the result was a commission um, to, in 1980, they created another commission in 1980 uh, to gauge the desire of people of Guam, but also have this component of education where they're going to educate the public. This the com first commission on self-determination was to educate the public on advantages and disadvantages of each of the statuses, and then again, have a plebiscite to choose to his preference, you know, between statehood, independence, um, free association, commonwealth was included this time, um, the status quo. And at the time in 1980, this is when Guam had to decide, okay, well, who are, who are going to be voting in this plebiscite, you know, who is the self? And at this time, this is when the commission decides to define a tomorrow as uh, in the South as those born on Guam before 19, August 1st, 1950, um, the, date, the Organic Act passed, and then all descendants of those people. So as a result of that, um, that plebiscite in 1982, we had, again, majority, well, this time majority choosing Commonwealth, 49%, then followed again by statehood, 10% uh, was status quo, and then they did a runoff election in which um, 73% chose Commonwealth versus 27% chose statehood. So as a result of that um, plebiscite, and they put together a draft Commonwealth Act, um, but that did not go anywhere. So now we're in 1984, and we have yet another commission form. This time it's the second commission on self-determination. And their job is to produce a document, um, a draft Commonwealth Act that's going to be submitted to Congress. Um, and, and in 1987, I think we can go to the next slide, Nicole. Um, 1987 voters approved this draft Commonwealth Act. And what this Commonwealth Act, like what the voters approved in 1987, so now we're about 30 years ago, was um, that 
there would be, it would prohibit the federal use of eminent domain power to acquire land for more military bases. Um, it would require the return of excess uh, DOD lands to the local government and would require a consultation with Guam officials before there would be any major changes to um, the force levels that are on Guam and the base missions. And then it was intended to provide greater authority to negotiate um, for, for Guam to negotiate commercial agreements directly with Asia, um, Asian Pacific states, and um, just provide a greater measure of autonomy. Um, in 1988, so we see then from 1988 to 1997, that draft Commonwealth Act that was approved by voters was continually submitted to Congress, but it didn't gain any movement. So this was under the Bush and Clinton administrations at the time. Um, and it was essentially kind of seen as, well, after 1997, there was no movement. So it just did not appear to be on the table anymore, this Commonwealth Act. So in 1997, that's when the legislature creates Commission on Decolonization, which we have now, um, to take over the work of the previous Commission on Self-Determination. And again, Similar to the previous commissions, it's tasked with determining the needs and desires of the people of Guam. And before determining that those needs and desires through a plebiscite, educating the public on what the options are. And so the specifically, they're seeking to educate the public on independence, free association, and statehood. This was also when the decolonization registry was created to register voters who would participate in the plebiscite. And the 2000 plebiscite law, um, that is when we see that who is eligible to vote um, are native inhabitants of Guam and that defines native inhabitants as persons who became US citizens by virtue of the Guam Organic Act of 1950 and their descendants. So we see in 2011, I believe uh, Davis, um, uh, sued the Guam Election Commission after he was denied, a, a man named Davis was denied the request to register for the plebiscite because he didn't meet this definition of native inhabitant. And so he challenged the law that uh, saying it violated um, the Constitution, the 14th and 15th Amendments, and the Voting Rights Act, um, and the Organic Act. And um, this case kind of uh, uh, I mean, it, it went through the district court and then it was up on appeal. And ultimately at the lower court, the district court level, it granted a motion for summary judgment um, in favor of Davis, you know, against the uh, Guam plebiscite saying that um, Guam could not conduct a plebiscite that's gonna restrict voters to native, native inhabitants of Guam. Um, and I just want to read this portion of the decision that the, the conclusion of the court's decision was that the court recognizes the long history of colonization of the island and its people and the desire of those colonized to have their right to self-determination. However, the court must also recognize the rights of others who have made Guam their home and the U.S. Constitution does not permit for the government to exclude otherwise qualified voters in participating in an election where public uses are decided. Um, simply because they don't have the correct ancestry or bloodline. Um, and so when this, this case was appealed to the Ninth Circuit, um, the appellate court, um, it's stating, it, confirming what the district court found, um, stating that the plebiscite that we sought to have um, was race-based and violated constitutionally protected voting rights. Um, so that, uh, was I believe I could say you ultimately concluded um, the Supreme Court denied uh, the writ. Um, I believe it was last year, 2020. Um, and that's where kind of where we are today. Um, the now the governor said, I believe she said and she or stated publicly that there's an indication to move forward with the plebiscite. Um, but it might require changing Guam laws to address, you know, how we define who can register and vote in this plebiscite. So that is where we were from um, essentially like the organic deck to now in terms of trying to um, broaden our self-governance, self-determine our political status, 
um, and kind of frame the context of what lessons can be learned going forward. Next, I'm going to talk about some recent cases that implicate uh, the political status, but um, and more specifically to voting rights. So first, we have TWA v. United States. Um, sorry, see the typo uh, in United. Um, so here we had plaintiffs suing to force the government to recognize that American Samoans had birthright citizenship. Um, and essentially their argument was like, was based on the citizenship, citizenship clause of the United States Constitution. All persons born in the US are US citizens and um, any federal law or policy that would deny citizenship based on um, to people in American Samoa specifically was unconstitutional. And the federal government argued against this and said that Congress has the power to exclude these Americans who are born in US territories um, from the constitutional guarantee of citizenship based on the insular cases. And um, the Court of Appeals um, for the District of Columbia ruled in favor of the government and said that the citizenship is not guaranteed and, um, to apply to unincorporated US territories. Next, we have Segovia v. United States. So Segovia was a federal voting rights lawsuit that was seeking to expand voting rights in the US territories, um, essentially arguing where you, the, the right to vote does not depend on where you live. And there the plaintiffs were citizens, US citizens who were living in Puerto Rico, Guam and the US Virgin Islands. And they were denying very specific laws are challenging very specific laws that were denying them the right to vote, specifically the uniform formed in overseas citizen applicants, Illinois um, law that providing for voting of military and overseas voters. And um, in Segovia, oh, then we have Fitzsimano, the United States. So in Fitzsimano, um, we had a, a, a man who was born on US soil in, in American Samoa, um, but he was uh, challenging that he was not being recognized as a citizen, but instead being labeled a national. And so the district court that this was heard in ruled that this denial of citizenship was unconstitutional and that he was a full U.S. citizen based on the citizen, citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, and this is, you know, uh, a big win in terms of uh, for the plaintiffs and, and I believe for the people of Guam in, by implication, um, although this was, uh, the decision was stayed pending appeal. Um, but the, the key takeaway is that in Fitzsimano, the ruling was that individuals in U.S. territories have the same right to citizenship as individuals born in the 50 states or the District of Columbia. So um, this uh, would, this is contrary to what the insular cases say, you know, about Congress's powers over territories and, and our citizenship is granted um, by virtue of acts of Congress. Um, but there is no decision yet. We're expecting, there's a decision expected soon. Um, I believe the case was heard last fall, um, and, but either way, however, the 10th circuit where this was appealed decides this case is probably gonna be appealed to the Supreme Court um, of the United States. Um, and then let me mention Reeves uh, versus Nago. So this is a case um, that, I'm, that I'm local counsel for um, that is currently in the District Court of Hawaii. And this case is like Segovia and that it addresses the issue uh, uh, that underlies these federal and state overseas voting laws that US citizens who are living in certain US territories um, or in a foreign country can vote for president and, and they have voting representation in Congress by, by absentee ballot. But if they are living in other US territories, they cannot um, and namely Guam and the US Virgin Islands. So if you, in this case, we had former residents of Hawaii who are challenging the law, um, who are saying, you know, if I had lived, moved overseas to a foreign country, I'd still be able to vote as a former resident of Hawaii and have representation in US Congress and for pres uh, vote for president. But just because I moved to Guam or the Virgin Islands, I can't. 
Um, so that case is really right now we're in the very early stages. Um, and so we have not reached the uh, hearing on the merits yet. Now, um, just this past fall, we've had a very interesting case in the United States Supreme Court and that uh, and a decision that resulted. And this was the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico versus Aurelius Investment. And so um, Aurel this case arose out of the uh, legislation that resulted as uh, from Congress as a result of Puerto Rico's bankruptcy or um, insolvency. So back in 2016, when President Obama had signed a law that allowed Puerto Rico to declare bankruptcy, um, it, that law, PROMESA, or the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, allowed them to restructure their debt. But in order to do that, they need to supervise Puerto Rico's finances. And so that law created a panel of seven people um, that would govern, that kind of have oversight of finances and it included people like an insurance executive, a bank chief executive, and a private equity manager. And so where you had Puerto Rico, who previously had the island's governor and their representatives deciding what they spend their money on, um, how, you know, how they budget, now this board, this private board would have the veto power over the budget. And so what the Aurelius case, came, um, how that came about was Aurelius investment um, was the plaintiffs and they attacked this law, PROMESA, um, uh, saying that because board members had significant authority over federal law uh, and they were not appointed by the president and they're not confirmed by the Senate, that this was a violation of the appointments clause of the United States Constitution. And um, the other side argued, well, the appointments clause doesn't apply to Puerto Rico because of the insular cases. Now, ultimately, the Supreme Court decided that the Constitution's appointment clause did not restrict the appointment or selection of the members of this board, this private board, who. Um, but the court declined to rely on the insular cases. It rejected the argument that the insular cases were um, uh, deciding on this issue. And however, it said um, whatever the court did note that whatever the continued validity of the insular cases still is, we're not gonna extend them in these cases. And so that language is part of a history of language by the Supreme Court, where they have um, reinforced this trend that they think the insular cases are outdated, um, but, and they're not gonna use them to curtail constitutional rights. Um, and, and this goes against the trend of holding that constitu various constitutional provisions do in fact apply to the territories. Um, so that is kind of, and this, this decision, that's where the Aurelius investment decision was. And this kind of informs what may happen in Fitzumano, um, what may happen at Reeves, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but where we really are in terms of what the Supreme Court thinks of the insular cases. And all of these lawsuits, um, you can see how they might implicate our voting, well, definitely implicate our voting rights, our citizenship rights, um, but also our self-governance. And for in terms of uh, Segovia and Reeves in particular, these are part of a broader effort to um, expand voting rights or advocate for full voting rights for those in the territories in Guam. Now, um, so that's kind of my history slash uh, lesson from a legal perspective. And I thought that would be helpful, I guess, in discussing the path forward and what lessons are learned from um, our previous self-determination efforts and kind of prompt the discussion on or further the discussion that we have, you know, with ourselves um, and as an island on what is it that we really want? You know, uh, what what is it, that, uh, do, what do we want? Do we wanna um, vote for president? You know, do we want full representation in Congress? Um, do we want, uh, or do we, uh, do we want to, to resolve our political status first? 
And is the pursuit of these, you know, two issues, are they mutually exclusive? Are they contradictory in any way? Um, are they uh, counterproductive? Um, and I'm not going to endeavor to answer those questions <laughs> for anybody, but I think those are the serious questions that kind of result um, the from when you see uh, kind of the history, um, and I won't call them mistakes, but really lessons learned from where we've gone in the past with our efforts, and then looking at what is the political environment we have right now, the context we have right now, and the prompt for ac action going forward. Thank you. Well, Vanessa, okay, so I'm, I'll ask you some questions. Um, and, and I guess, <laughs> uh, and I see we have some Q&A, but just there are some out there who have argued, and I, Dr. Underwood, I think, had a question or a comment or observation about the, the Constitution and how some of those efforts were opposed locally because the idea was uh, you're kind of putting the, the caravel before the cart. You're resolving this without really letting the community explore long-term what the relationship with Guam and the United States should be. And, and to those who have kind of raised this issue of, well, if we pursue and are successful in obtaining the ability to vote for president or to participate in federal elections, does that foreclose our ability down the road if we, if free association or independence, as an example, were, were to be the, the majority of the votes given? Does that impede those efforts? Um, and just to clarify the question, so it's a question if we pursue um, the the expansion of voting rights, is that going to impede our efforts at self-determination? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, and I'm no uh, constitutional scholar, <laughs> and, and I, I should have give, given the same disclaimers at the beginning um, about what my background is, but um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure at what point. I don't think that the pursuit and the expansion of voting rights is um, uh, and fighting the insular cases in its applicability. Um, it precludes us from seeking from self governors or from you know seeking independence. I don't think so. Um, obviously, choosing independence versus full on statehood and pursuing that is going to foreclose that but I don't I think that there is a effort that needs to be I think those efforts can go in tandem parallel the expansion of voting rights and self determination at the same time and I think that the more um, definitely abolishing the insular cases and um, having voting rights will in my opinion would only leverage our self determination efforts. Okay, and, and I know, uh, I guess I'll comment now just a little bit, as I gave my presentation on fundamental rights, there have been a few examples with the covenant in particular in the NMI, where the insular cases have given the Ninth Circuit the ability to uphold things which would normally violate the Constitution. Grand jury is a constitutionally provided right, um, but the NMI has, in their covenant, not extended grand jury or the, the requirement to present a criminal case to grand jury and the Ninth Circuit upheld them kind of saying you guys negotiated this we're going to live by it. I think the more fascinating and, and Vanessa I'm going to ask you this question too uh, to get your thoughts on this but with article 12 and the restraint on land ownership that was another case where the Ninth Circuit said there is no fundamental right to long-term property interest in the NMI and they kind of relied on the covenant Prior to the Guam Davis case, there was another case that was filed by a, a registered voter in the NMI who said you could not limit the vote on Article 12 and the restraint on land alienation to NMI descendants and those who normally, the, the people who could own land should be the ones who vote on whether or not that restriction should remain in place. And it went up to the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit found that to be an impermissible uh, race-based discrimination for, for voting and it violated the 15th Amendment. So for those in American Samoa, as an example, who are looking at this and, and kind of seeing um, what the long-term implications would be, I and mean, what would you, do you have any comments on that or, or how that would work together? Oh gosh, <laughs> um, I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I 
I don't at this time. I'm not sure, you know, how I want to address that question. Um, what uh, fair enough. Sorry, I, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just, uh, you know, we, we have the plebiscite and I, you know, we can, I guess, talk about it now and make it more conversational. But we have a plebiscite and we have the restraint on alienation that the NMI has, has got a court to, and NMI and American Samoa are the only two places I know of that are part of the United States where there is a limitation on who can own land. And that probably would not withstand constitutional scrutiny if a similar thing were adopted in California. So you know, the one thing that I, I guess looking at and surveying the, the landscape when it comes to the insular cases is there are no certainties. What was a fundamental right and is recognized at the federal and state level with respect to grand jury as an example, the Ninth Circuit can say, no, you guys are out when it comes to uh, someone who lives in the NMI, you don't have a constitutional right to grand jury. So for those who are kind of just worried about where the courts may go, because Congress has been given a lot of deference in this area, um, for a path forward, I mean, it, it, is it really clear what the trajectory would be or are we kind of just picking fights as we can and finding, putting our efforts behind selectively and strategically fights that we think are, are worth taking. Hey, Levin, I, you kind of cut out, got distorted at the end, so. Oh, okay. Um, that was probably the most sure. brilliant part of my, my, uh, my, my talking. So I, you guys missed out, I'm sorry for those of you who are watching. Um, but but I, I guess, and this is just me, and when I hear people who are scared, I will, I will say, of what will happen as we get before the courts, because there really is a, a, a huge area of unpredictability when you raise an issue. Right. And, and I think Article 12 in the NMI, um, I mean, for me, it makes sense that if I can own land, I should be the one who votes on whether or not we should continue that practice. Ninth Circuit disagreed and said 15th Amendment applies in the NMI and everyone can vote on whether or not Article 12 should continue if you want to vote on it. So I guess as we pursue voting rights, I mean, is there a similar concern? Okay, you get voting rights, you get citizenship, you start to look more like a state. Does that give mm -hmm. the Ninth Circuit and other circuits more of an ability to start striking down some of these things that maybe culturally are significant to territories. Right, so like what are the unintended consequences of these states if we're not, I guess, very strategic or tailored in our approach? Um, and I, I guess my response to that too is what, uh, what advantage do we get from waiting and doing nothing? You know, um, uh, uh, how does that help us in any way? And if it's not helping us, you know, is a, are we, is the status quo, um, I mean, the status quo is not good, well, in my opinion, isn't sufficient. Um, and so, uh, you know, there has to be, there has to be movement um, and there's no movement just by waiting, you know, and I guess on that note, I wanted to ask, I do realize I did have a question for you. And so after the Davis case, I mean, are there any, um, what are the, what is preventing us from having a plebiscite now? I mean, in light of the ruling, so it can't be the way that native inhabitants are defined. Um, how do we move forward or can we move forward? It, it, well, at least in the domestic area, uh, and speaking just as a local government, there would need to be a change in, in who can participate in the plebiscite. And I believe even the triggering mechanism kind of was tied to the registry. So there would need to be a, an amendment to our, our current plebiscite statute. Do you know if there's been any effort to do this thus far? That, uh, I, um, in terms of legislation, I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Um, I know that there was some discussion of what international avenues might be available. And some of the things that we, we talk about in the international realm, and I'm not a national law expert, let alone international law, but for the non-self-governing territories, it's also been interesting to see as more recent cases come out, Puerto Rico, as an example, I believe has been put back on the non-self-governing 
list of territories, you know, and they were the most advanced of all the territories. And I know Dr. Underwood is in the audience and we had a very awkward moment when we were in the CNMI giving a similar presentation and he pointed out the NMI was the only ones who voluntarily put themselves in a territorial position. And, um, but they, they look at it, they negotiate benefits. So it's just, again, the uncertainty of what will happen once you lose control and you're so you give up sovereignty, essentially. So I, I see a lot more questions coming mm -hmm. in. I could have used those at the end of my presentation. Or maybe to you, Vanessa, everyone has questions for you. They're, so they're long, so I'm trying to read through them and listen at the same time. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, I have a great question. Um, when trying to hold a vote for the status of Guam, we're constantly held to the law and constitution of the United States. The very same institution we're trying to vote where not to leave. Um, so are, is there any way around this? Are we bound to federal law? Well, this is an interesting area because I think Congress would be able to authorize something like the plebiscite as it was initially drafted. So what the Ninth Circuit said is that the local government cannot make those types of restrictions on who qualifies or who's qualified to vote. Um, and, and I do want, there was a little bit of nuance in the Ninth Circuit's opinion, and they looked at the history of the statute and they said, you know, on its face, gaining citizenship through the Organic Act may not have been automatically a, a proxy for race, but when they looked at the history of the statute itself, they kind of said, well, this clearly was a, a quick fix after Rice versus Cayetano, and, and who knows what the outcome would have been if the initial draft of the bill had been the qualification of citizenship by virtue of the Organic Act. So I, I do want to flag that there was a little bit of, of it, it was a little bit more complex in the analysis of the Ninth Circuit for our, our current definition of, of who would be eligible to vote in the plebiscite. But to answer the question, federal law, if Congress were to authorize us to have a plebiscite in the way that the current legislation is, it's it would probably pass constitutional muster. Thanks. I have another question. Um, this is from Dr. Underwood, and he's asking, is someone going to answer my question? So I need to ask it. <laughs> um, yes, Vanessa support? will. <laughs> well, he said, I have already answered the question. He wants to know um, if the AG, if you have an opinion on this. Um, it's important to understand the attorney's point of view on, about whether pursuit of greater voting participation within the US system precludes or prejudices advocacy for a full range of political status options. So I've already stated that um, I don't necessarily think it's harmful. Um, do you have, have an opinion on that or any commentary on that? I, the way I compartmentalize the ends of the cases, whether they came out the way they did or they came out the other way, we would still be in the same predicament we are with respect to our political status. So for, for me, the ends of the cases and overturning that uh, it will not resolve our political status issue. Now, whether or not fully the full application of the constitution um, would in, kind of prejudice our ability to pursue self-determination, I mean, that, that would not seem to make it would seem to be bad to say that using the Bill of Rights as a shield against congressional overreach or as a shield against local government action would preclude us from resolving you know, and, and really working through the fact that we are currently governed by a, a body that we have no voting representation. In. And you know, I, I guess now as I, I think about my presentation, ultimately what I was getting at is we have all these constitutional rights to vote but that doesn't in itself give the right of the government to consent to the government itself. So it's like we have all these rights to vote, but we never actually enjoyed the right to elect our leaders from 1898 you know, until we had our first elected governor. Um, and I think that's really, for me, where there's a lot of tension between our, our voting rights and as we develop that and our underlying political status issues. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Dr. Underwood, I hope so. I have another question. Um, let me see if I can clarify. This is from the governor. Um, 
and says, I believe that pursuing voting rights could give the US argument of why pursuing self-determination uh, is now you can vote for president. I think there are some words missing here. Um, therefore, we are giving you more representation. This is not the same in my mind as self-determination. Um, oh, okay, so pursuing voting rights um, is not the same as self-determination. Would you agree? Uh, I would agree, yeah. I, I, I would also, uh, I, I would also agree that, and this goes, I guess, to Dr. Underwood's comment about the prejudice and what would, the implications would be, which is, you guys have been asking for the ability to vote for president. We've given it to you. Now we've resolved your issue. You guys are participating at the federal level. You're you're in. Um, so I, again, I can see why people would be concerned about whether that could be overread as now political status and self-determination issues have been resolved. Okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to field the questions. Uh, I think in going back to the plebiscite, um, so would it be fair to say that the only thing that's really prohibiting us from moving forward with a plebiscite now is determining who can actually vote in it, redefining who native inhabitants are? Yeah, I mean, that's really more of a political discussion than a legal one for me. Um, you know, who gets to vote, what the purpose of the vote is, and, and that's something that we're going to have to work through as, as a community and our senators to, to figure out those answers. The courts aren't going to resolve it. Okay. I mean, but just to clarify, the courts didn't say you can't have a plebiscite. They just said you can't have a plebiscite with the um, with the voters the way you have defined it as now. With the way That's correct. Has defined it as. They, okay. they found that the, the current eligibility requirements violates the 15th Amendment. Okay. Okay, I have a um, kind of an interesting thought um, from Robert Cruz. Uh, they they're curious as if there's ever been a survey on how those who would who were otherwise unqualified to vote in the plebiscite would vote anyway. If it's possible to have a vote and just open it up to everybody um, and and survey how they would vote if it's not binding on, on us, if it's not binding on Guam and it's not binding on Congress anyway, can we do that? You know, again, I think that's really more of a political than a legal question and the significant, I mean, there is some significance in who votes and, and what the purpose of, of the plebiscite would be. If the purpose of the plebiscite is determined to just be an assessment of everyone's ideas on, on what the future relationship between Guam and the United States should be, that type of criteria would probably meet it. Um, if the idea is that the colonized individuals are the ones who should be able to participate in the plebiscite, um, then that would serve a different function and different criteria would probably need to be to be come up to, to be developed. So on the political side, you kind of have to decide that first. What exactly is the point of this plebiscite? And then you would decide who participates. But I, I'm not aware of any, any recent efforts to to ascertain the general view on what political status would be favorable. Part of that, I think, is just as we continue to develop more education, uh, it should become more, more concrete. Because right now we're kind of talking in these, we know what statehood looks like, but free association, what would independence look like economically? And, and I know there are efforts to develop that type of material, but you know, it's hard to say, well, what would you vote for today? And you don't have a good grasp of what any of those options would functionally mean if they were selected and it was a course that we wanted to pursue. 
And you think that's the problem that we've had in the past is it is in fact just uh, not understanding what it is that we're choosing. Well, I guess going back to my uh, frozen yogurt analogy, like we, we look, it feels like we're part of a democracy, right? I mean, but for these types of talks, everyone will probably be okay to get a few bubbles here and there. We don't get to vote for president. Um, Congress people don't know Guam's not a foreign country. Um, but I, I, I actually think that there's a lot of work that can be done. And there is a recent case that came up through Guam's pending in the Ninth Circuit involving social security benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, because that, that's the piece that I think the government of Guam spends so much. And I know we don't pay in uh, federal taxes and that, that's where the other thing comes into play. But for all these programs that are there to support the neediest in our community, we either don't get them or we're capped. Um, and that's the government of Guam now is left to, to fill in those gaps and to take care of our community and those who are in need. So I'd say economically, we need to be able to make an argument of what it would mean to get the full protection, equal protection, right? Everyone keeps using it uh, against us, um, but how could we argue and expand and, and talk about it in concrete terms? Because again, oh, we're a territory, unincorporated territory. Most people, that has no impact on them in their minds on the day-to-day, -day, um, their day-to-day -day activities. So that, that's where the challenge is. How do you make it real in terms of what it would mean to change our status. I'm looking through the questions right now. I can't tell if some of them are directed at us or um, in the chat. Um. I got a question, Did, what important lessons on self-determination have you learned on any of the cases that you've worked on? As a general proposition, I will say that we don't give enough credit to those who have come before us and have worked hard to get us. I mean, I think the fight for citizenship, and yes, we've named a school after F.B. Leon Guerrero, but I, I see a lot of maybe not my generation or my generation too. Like we don't realize how hard it was to move the ball and to advance the discussion at all. Having an elected governor, we have, we're joined by the governor today. Like that took effort. Getting a Supreme Court to, was a huge political effort to get done. So all of these things that we've accomplished, you know, I, I think it may not be the direction we wanna go, but it, there was a lot of energy and, and fight put into it. and. Citizenship is, again, I come back to it. People fought hard because they thought citizenship was the way that we were gonna gain all these other rights and this other access to being able to move towards self-determination. It didn't pan out that way, but they didn't have the benefit of knowing that at the time. So as we develop what we want, you know, a plebiscite, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, they're gonna be like, what was that generation doing wasting decades on a plebiscite when they should have been doing A, B, and C? So. I guess my, my lesson would be when you look back at all the effort and energy that's been put into this, like just to be mindful and respectful and not to be dismissive of, oh, why would anyone want to be a US citizen? Because our nanas and tatas fought for that <laughs> to, to get us to where we're at today. And maybe we go a different direction, but it's always okay to, to be respectful. Hmm. Going back to your frozen yogurt analogy, what flavor would you deem as the core values or important principles for the people in Guam to understand and consider? And what toppings should be taken as lightly? Taken lightly. Well, I mean, I, I just, I think for me, and it really comes back to the consent of the government. And if we can't achieve that, that seems like a very basic thing. The Declaration of Independence talked about, that's how governments are formed and Dr. Underwood Again, I, I think I'm going to give you, you, you planted that seed in my head whenever you would walk into Congress that, that's there and present. You know, it's just, we haven't gotten to the point where we have control over our, our own government. And yes, it looks like other governments and it smells like other governments, um, but we're black licorice yogurt right now. So whatever it is moving forward, if it's statehood, if it's free association or if it's independence, we just need to fix the core 
and then the voting rights and equal protection and all of that should flow from, from that source and not in reverse. I understand, I, and I appreciate that sentiment that um, we should appreciate the work that's come, uh, the efforts that it took um, to make, uh, to get to where we are today, to get citizenship, to get some, um, the Organic Act and, and a civilian government. Um, but do you think that there are lessons to be learned in terms of timing and how we coordinate and focus our efforts and when? I mean, the, the, with DC pushing for statehood, I, and I know Puerto Rico, there's a lot more, I believe there was a recent bill that was introduced. So there, there has to be an urgency generated, not only locally, but nationally. Uh, when that moment will, will happen, um, but it feels like we're still uncertain on the ground where we want to go. So it, it's hard to capitalize on that movement or that momentum. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. I think that's uh, okay. Oh, and well, we have one more case question. I have a question. So as uh, to clarify in terms of being an unincorporated territory into the insular cases, um, we do not have fundamental rights under the constitution and we only have personal rights. Um, and this is what is preventing us from voting as president. What exactly do you mean by personal rights? And is that a, is that a correct um, summation of what, what you had stated in terms of what those cases do? Well, the, the DC had a, an amendment passed to get to participate in the Electoral College. Um, so uh, the Ninth Circuit basically said, Guam, the president is not elected by popular vote. So the only way for you to meaningfully participate in the presidential election is to have electors, which you either need to become a state or you need to get an amendment passed that extends it to you. In this political climate, I, I don't see that happening with the, the uh, partisanship. And uh, so I, I don't know what the, the viability is of a, an amendment being passed that would give Guam electors. But if there's national change to make it I mean, that would be interesting if they were to change it to a, a popular vote and the president is elected by popular vote, would Guam be able to participate in, in it at that point because we would have removed the electoral college system? That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. Vanessa, you have thoughts? What would you, how would you, how would you vote on that? <laughs> I don't know. Um... Okay, I think we have, did, did we want, um, Nicole, were we trying to get questions to be asked live on camera now? Maybe that would help clarify too. And some of these ones, questions that are considered open have not been resolved. Uh, people are invited to, uh, uh, if they wanna ask their questions live, they may. I think they've also put them in the Q&A, but if anybody would like to um, ask a question, there's a feature that allows us to um, um, uh, unmute you or uh, allow you to, to talk. So um, if you're interested, um, uh, I, can, I can go ahead and do that. You can let me know through, uh, to all the attendees there, uh, you can let me know through the, um, through the chat and I can go ahead and allow that. We did have this other question. I'm not. Uh, I'm. I'm sorry if you guys already answered this, but um, it, the question uh, is: Some U.S. Supreme Court precedents, like the insular cases, cause problems with efforts to move forward with either self determination or to seek rights that others enjoy within the U.S. Uh, what has been done or can be done to overturn this kind of precedent?
Yeah, um, I guess I, I think that uh, I can't speak to exhaustively all the cases that have been done, um, but those cases that I kind of highlighted at the end, um, in particular, um, the, I'm just pulling up the slides again, um, Fitzamano and then, uh, which is going, might be resolved soon. And then the Aurelius case that was decided. So that US Supreme Court case, although it declined to you know, rely on the insular cases and their doctrine and reaching their decision, um, it did indicate you know, where they're at in terms of how they see the insular cases. And when I, I went through the background of that and showed how you know this was not, um, I guess not the typical, uh, or the challenge is kind of indirect, right? This came out as, as a result of challenging a law that uh, provided um, oversight for Puerto Rico's finances and, and, and base essentially veto power to Puerto Rico's governor. Um, and the plaintiff was actually like a, a hedge fund man, a hedge fund. Um, and they were, and you can see how the, the insular cases could be overturned and there's definitely been arguments made in this case, the Aurelius case and in others um, that I discussed that are trying to get the Supreme Court to say, you know, this is, um, you're right, this is what the insular cases does, but it's no longer good law, you know, and overturn it that way. And it may not be in the, it may be in a way that we do not anticipate or indirectly. I don't think when, you know, whatever the hedge fund brought the lawsuit, they were seeking to overturn the insular cases. You know, it was kind of an unlikely ally for Puerto Rico in that respect. Well, and I'll just add, uh, we have our, our Supreme Court argument in the Ordot case coming up in about a month now, but it's extremely rare for the Supreme Court to accept cases and they only will do so under very limited circumstances. One of the, Vanessa's involved in a case in, with voting rights, but a circuit split is another example where the Supreme Court will kind of intervene because they want to establish a uniform application of law. The Supreme Court recently accepted this last term, uh, the challenge to social security benefits and the exclusion of Puerto Rican residents. And they're gonna be hearing that probably in the fall of, of this year. Um, and I, I find it fascinating as a, not a historian, but I always enjoy reading Justice Marshall, Thurgood Marshall, and seeing when he would vote with Justice Brennan. But Thurgood Marshall is the, a champion of, of the territories, I would say, when it comes to Supreme Court justices and the, the Supreme Court cases that said you can exclude the territories from, from benefits um, were, were decided without oral argument. They were decided summarily and Justice Marshall was the only one who dissented, basically saying we should at least give this the, uh, uh, the full hearing and briefing before we decide something that has such a huge impact on what would turn out to be millions of people who live in the territories who are US citizens. So that will probably be one of the biggest insular case updates that we're gonna get, I mean, in decades and, and the implications are, are huge and the stakes are, are very high. Um, I saw Dr. Underwood commented, you know, no taxation without representation, or representation without taxation. And really what it comes down to is it, you know, adding Puerto Rico and, and the territories to SSI would, would increase it by 3%. And the argument is like, well, because you guys don't pay federal income tax and Puerto Rico, if you have a chance to read the briefs, they're amazing because they point out that I guess Puerto Rico generates more tax income, not, not income tax, but taxes than six states do um, when you kind of expand the category of, of contributing to the, the federal fisc, there was a district court decision that came out recently on SNAP benefits in Puerto Rico and Medicaid that struck down the exclusion of Puerto Rican residents from those programs. And, uh, you know, I'm going to brag and say he was my evidence professor, uh, Judge Young, sitting out of Massachusetts. But if you get yeah, it's a beautifully written decision and order. And if you have a, a chance to read it. So, uh, I guess I will want to give pay homage to uh, Judge Torreya, who passed away this year. And he was, again, a great champion for the territories and for equality in the territories. And he was the author 
of the First Circuit decision that struck down the exclusion of, of Puerto Rican residents from SSI benefits and the implications that it would have for Guam. So, you know, going back to the, these things have been going on for such a long time, but that, that Vallejo Madero case will, will probably be the watershed case for our generation. So Levin um, or Vanessa, thank you so much. I learned a lot. Um, my comment about the, uh, and my question about the argument that the US is gonna make with the vote, if we were to be given a, a right to vote for president is that their argument would, they would use that to argue about status quo. I think that's what they would use that. So uh, Guam, why do you wanna do self-determination when now you can vote for president and now maybe you can have a congressional uh, voting representative. Um, and I know that um, previous secretaries of the Department of Interior were the ones that were pursuing this status quo. So basically what it is, is I think giving us some, um, some rights, but not all uh, as, as to our own self-governance. That's where I was coming from in that, in that uh, comment. Thank you, Governor. I agree, it's a concern. Uh, and I think that was part of the concern when it came to the constitution, just being mindful of what these actions and the long-term implications could be. Um, and Puerto Rico, I believe, got a reality check with the PROMESA cases that they, and the, there was a double jeopardy case that would also, was also argued a little bit before that, where the Supreme Court, I wanna say it was just Justice Ginsburg, who was the author, said you have no sovereignty outside of the federal government. So, you know, that, that probably rankled a lot of the folks in Puerto Rico, just to be reminded that territories are all the same. You might be the fanciest territory, but you're no different than, than Guam in a lot of ways. And no one wants to be compared to Guam, right? When you've got a commonwealth, you have a constitution, you have an article three judge, but going back again to the fixing, and we were just plain yogurt. They, they had all the trappings, and they, but we're still yogurt at the end of the day, so. And I just want to make one more comment before I know Dr. Underwood uh, also probably wanted to chime in, but um, this issue about the Davis versus Guam. And uh, now we can move forward with the plebiscite, but we have to allow everyone who's not a native inhabitant. And I think the political question is, do we want to uh, just have the native uh, inhabitants be the vote? be eligible for voting or do we want to include everyone that's that is in Guam and uh, right now we cannot do just native inhabitants like you had mentioned because the court says you cannot it's it's declared unconstitutional so my issue here is if we decide to just be very strong and say native inhabitants only um, then we would have to make some changes to our plebiscite uh, legislation, I understand, to address some of the concerns uh, that was brought up in, in the district court, in the, in the ninth district court. And I, I'm not too sure what all those concerns are, but my understanding is that we may uh, be able to pursue native inhabitants as eligible if we redo our plebiscite legislation to address the concerns of the, of the district court. Are you following that at all, Levin? I am governor and I, I, I mean, we were on parallel tracks with the Tremor Land Trust and, and in a lot of ways, the Tremor Land Trust case had us ask ourselves and, and you were, thank you. And, I know Attorney Phillips was very involved in it, but what is the actual point of the program? And you know, there, that's a political question, but it, it ended up being, we convinced the Department of Justice that this really was a land restoration program in response to the vast yeah. quantities of land that were taken from locals you know, after World War II. So uh, that's a similar kind of soul searching we need to have when it comes to the plebiscite. What is, what is it that we are trying to accomplish and then that will dictate who, who should be allowed to participate. So if it's just to get a temperature check on everyone, you know, what, what do we want, which A, B or C, um, 
then it would be much easier to open up for everyone. But if it really is, well, it's meant as a tool of decolonization, then the question is, how do you define who is colonized without using a race-based classification, which is what I believe the Ninth Circuit found impermissible. Okay. Thank you. Am I on next or? Uh, yeah, Dr. Ford. Huh? Go ahead, Dr. Ford. Hi, how are you doing, Vanessa? And, 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 and thank you very much for uh, your presentation. That takes a lot of detailed uh, work and I appreciate the, uh, the effort that's put into it. And uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, kind of a politician, although I like to think of myself as a teacher more than a politician, but uh, I should have been a lawyer because you know, the thing is, is that when, when you're in a tough position as a lawyer, you can always say, that's a political decision. So I love that. I just love that. And of course, in, in many respects, it is. And so the question is really uh, assessing the political environment that we're in right now. And uh, the political environment that we're in, uh, in the Biden administration is certainly different uh, than it is in the Trump administration, and certainly was even different from the Obama administration, which in this regard, uh, and these issues may have been actually a, a disappointment but then, of course, we don't know whether that disappointment uh, resulted from the lack of uh, concerted effort from Guam and the territories. And that's why the Obama administration wasn't as engaged. So hopefully, as a result of this conversation, uh, there would be uh, an effort uh, to uh, kind of secure a place inside the Biden administration head or policymaking about dealing with uh, territorial issues as, as an administrative matter. As a, as a matter of, uh, of executive branch policy. When up to now, every time that question has been raised, they always defer to Congress and they say, you know, Congress has plenary power. Uh, yes, Congress has plenary power, but the executive branch always has the right and, um, you know, I would say the obligation to introduce legislation in Congress uh, that could move. And they're signaling their support for a given direction uh, would make a lot of difference. So there's I think a little bit more hope in the, uh, the uh, Biden-Harris uh, administration to secure this. And if the Puerto Rican issue and the Dis uh, District of Columbia issues are resolved, uh, then it really opens up the way for the smaller territories. Because in reality, that's the other political hurdle we have to face is that uh, uh, whatever, whatever we're able to achieve will automatically sort of accrue to Puerto Rico uh, in particular. And so if they don't want to give it to Puerto Rico, then they're not likely to give it to us. But if, you know, all bets are off the table with Puerto Rico and they decide to become a state and, and that uh, comes to pass, then all of these are certainly uh, uh, so much easier. And so I, I just uh, wanted to congratulate you and, uh, and uh, you know, just uh, kind of plant that kind of thinking uh, amongst ma many of our policymakers um, it's an historical point, uh, and it's not one that's kind of easily understood uh, looking at it uh, 40 years ago. Uh, but when the Constitution was first proposed by the, uh, uh, by the Congress, it was meant as a kind of a hedge against the president, the executive branch, because the executive branch was already in the process they were negotiating uh, their way out of the uh, trust territory of the Pacific Islands, and, and they were negotiating the compacts, and they were negotiating the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas. And uh, President Ford had indicated through a sort of internal policy memo in the Ford administration that whatever the CNMI got, Guam was going to get no less, which implied that it could have gotten more. And so Congress, uh, really under the leadership of uh, Congressman Burton, stepped in and came up with this idea of having a, a, a constitution as the sort of the way out. And at the same time, and ex, uh, exert uh, congressional um, authority. And we've been kind of stuck in that congressional merry-go-round for a hell of a long time now. And, um, you know, 
as a result of that, Guam rejected that constitution, said do political status. They say, well, we can always go back and revote the constitution. Yeah, for Virgin Islands has revoted it, I think, five times, and each time they voted it down. So I don't know whether who's spinning their wheels more, us not retaking up the constitution or the Virgin Islands continually taking it up and then voting it down. But the last point on the presidential vote, which is really a, a point that, uh, that uh, the Attorney General mentioned, which is that when you have uh, direct election of the president, it would seem natural to assume that there would be no bar on any US citizen participating in that. So this effort was led in the 90s by uh, uh, one Democrat, Bob Wise, and one Republican, Ray LaHood. Uh, who later on became Secretary of Transportation in the Obama administration, and Bob Wise later on became Governor of West Virginia. And uh, when they were advocating this, I told them, I said, well, this is great because once you, uh, if we get uh, free from the Electoral College and we have, then the territories would be able to vote. And they looked at me and they said, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> so I could tell by their reaction that they were hesitant to raise that issue. And in the movement today, which there's all these people who are who are constantly getting emails about eliminating the electoral college, even as I communicate with them, I can't get a straight answer on whether the territories are included or not, because they're afraid that if people said the, the citizen from the territories could vote, that would be held as a strike against direct election of president. So that political issue is, is very much alive. And I think the advocates of so-called getting rid of the Electoral College uh, have a little uh, a stain on their, uh, on their shield there that uh, they need to address. But I, I, I thank you for this opportunity uh, uh, to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. And I'm Andrew. sorry I'm not dressed for the occasion. I had to go put on a shirt. <laughs> So Vanessa or um, Attorney General Camacho, did you want to comment at all on, on Dr. Underwood's um, comments? Well, I, I will say as I see uh, DC statehood and, the, and Puerto Rico kind of pushing um, for some resolution there, you kind of see folks saying demanding statehood for all the territories and then later on kind of walking it back so, you know, I think we just need to be mindful that it's not a, a one, one size fits all when it comes to the territories and just be uh, Virgin Islands is in a different place in Puerto Rico than where we're at in the District of Columbia. But it's, I've seen some really good discussion come out of the statehood for all the territory uh, types of posts. And I do agree with, with Dr. Underwood that if there is momentum that's being pushed um, and they're clearing the path, then we, we should be very aware of it and, and to jump on and to advocate for ourselves, at least as, as much as we can get it to fit with our, our unique situation. And I, I saw a question uh, that came in through Facebook about race-based restrictions on voting. You know, I mean, I come back to it. If Congress were to say Guam can proceed with native inhabitants of Guam participating in a plebiscite defined as those who are given citizenship through the Organic Act. I mean, I think it would be hard pressed for a federal court to step in and to say that they've overstepped when Congress kind of denied us the right to vote for anything for, for decades. So um, but, that, that just could, could, I, could I just ask a question on that, uh, Levin? Because I know that we're trying to get away under the, uh, you know, some cases are trying to overturn the insular cases. But in, in this particular instance, being uh, the object or the victim of the insular case actually helps you make the case that you should be treated differently, does it not? I mean, because, yeah. you know, that it allows us to kind of uh, uh, have a, not, not exactly a do-over in history, but at least some uh, restorative justice in that regard. I, I do, and that's where I brought up, and I think you've commented on the covenant and how they've done things that really run counter to Supreme Court precedent. Um, and run, cons run counter to some of the established constitutional norms. So um, it's going to be very hard for us. And this is in the Puerto Rico cases, as we were in discussions, you can, they, they're asking for strict scrutiny to be applied anytime there's a, a discrimination. And it's like, well, 
I'm sure the NMI is going to be racing, you know, up in arms and and the and American Samoa as well. So again, we we all are in these different spaces. But yes, the insular cases giveth and they taketh away. And I think you pointed out in one of the the conferences that we did together that once we can figure out a way to exploit the insular cases, then they'll close the loophole, and then they'll they'll just say everyone now is the same um, moving forward, right? I, I think uh, Julian's argument about it's not a race, but it's social justice, I think could, could really be entwined, I think, with uh, Dr. Underwood's uh, comment about going to the executive, going to the Biden administration to help support us with that because his whole um, message out there and priority is social justice, parity, equity, and so forth. And I think maybe we could use that argument um, to pursue more, um, you know, our self determination and and also our the voting rights. Take that opportunity because he's <laughs> very much. This is what we're doing. Uh, in our congressional hearing, we took the opportunity, all the territories took the opportunity of parity to say, give us SSI, to say, uh, lift the Medicaid caps and so forth. So I think that's, I totally support that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Governor Liu and Dr. Underwood for your insights and comments. We're about five minutes over the end of the um, webinar. So I didn't know if um, Attorney General Camacho or Attorney um, Williams had any closing comments before we say goodbye. We're almost uh, past the end of uh, this important webinar. Did you have anything uh, you wanted else you wanted to say, um, Attorney Williams or um, Attorney General? Nothing? Not for me. I mean, I just, again, thank you for this opportunity and uh, the Q&A ended up, I mean, luckily was was very fruitful. I got a message from my wife saying she she woke up when, uh, when the Q&A, or when Vanessa and the Q&A started. So thank, thank <laughs> you for allowing me, inviting me to participate. It's been wonderful having both of you. Just an incredibly important conversation. So educational. I learned so much. I'm sure all of us did that were on the webinar today. Did you want to say anything, um, Attorney Williams, in closing out? Yeah, I mean, aside, uh, just kind of add on to the governor's comments and in terms of that theme of, of timing and learning from lessons past or, or the past or efforts in the past. I just got to wonder, I think we should ask ourselves um, when we're saying, okay, we need to take this opportunity or look at the timing or what can, what the fallout might be from Puerto Rico's efforts of self-determination and realize that that opportunity or window right now might be very limited in terms of how, you know, we, uh, we're much time is left in this administration and then the um, makeup of Congress right now, you know, um, and whether that's going to, you know, the next election, the midterms are going to um, close that window, <laughs> or if uh, we're, and when we'll have to wait again um, to really see efforts within the U.S. system become fruitful. So those are just my kind of my closing thoughts, um, but I really do appreciate um, the opportunity to speak. I'm not a um, a constitutional scholar by any means, <laughs> um, and uh, it's 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 been interesting and and really insightful to hear from the attorney general and to hear from Dr. Underwood and the governor and members of the audience who have been um, providing their comments. So thank you. And thank you. It's been a real privilege having both both you, um, Vanessa, and um, the attorney general. So thank you so much. And I just want to ask the audience before you sign off, um, if you could please complete the audience evaluation, which is in the Zoom chat box, and also you can find it via Facebook link. So thank you so much for joining us for our fourth webinar. We have one webinar left, which will be our fifth one, fifth and final, and that will be to launch our digital magazine, Unincorporated. And that will be held on Friday, um, April 30th. 
So I hope all of you that are here with us today will be able to join us for that um, launch event as well. Thank you again. See you, Smasi. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Lou.